Heavenly Father, we're so thankful yet again to be back in the house in the study of your word, Father. I'm so encouraged um, each and every week, Lord, as we are walking through uh, First Kings, Lord, learning so much about the history of Israel, the history of the kings, how you have sovereignly moved throughout history in order to accomplish your purposes, Father. And we're going to see just that tonight, you accomplishing your purposes, making yourself known, your glory known, and your name well known, Father. And I pray that you will also utilize us as vessels of the Lord in order to make your name known in our workplaces, in our communities, in our homes, um, in our families, Father. I, I pray that you will utilize these teachings to prepare us for this world and society that we are currently living in today. Lord, I pray that you'll embolden us by the power of your spirit to go therefore and to make disciples, to make known the power of God in this chaotic, secular culture. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will allow your truth to reign, may be reigning in the streets, in the courthouses, in our governments. Lord, just make yourself known. And Lord, we ask that you will use us to accomplish your works and your purposes. Lord, now I ask that what we know not will you teach us. What we have not will you give us. And who we are not will you make us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, uh, last week we had witnessed the beginning troubles and trials of the famine through the life of a widow and her son, if you recall that time there, um, as they were in the region of Tyre and Sidon and Phoenicia. Uh, the drought is hitting them horribly as well. However, if you recall, as Elijah comes onto the scene, despite the trials that were being faced at that time, the widow was actually able to attest to the God of Israel and his power. Remember, this is a Gentile widow who's coming to know the God of Israel. And through a series of events, she sees her provisions met. She sees her son raised or resuscitated, and she sees the Lord, God of Israel, prove himself time and again, simply by the basis of his word. Tonight it is really going to be no different, friend, at this time. Again, all the northern tribes, what we're going to see, uh, the northern tribes will all now attest to the power and the might of the God of Israel. So again, where, where this widow is able to see it in a private sense, the northern tribes of Israel are going to see it now in a public sense. If I were to outline our time in the text tonight, we're going to see five things. Uh, the first thing is we're going to see Elijah meets with Obadiah. Elijah meets with Obadiah. That'll be verses 1 through 16. Then we're going to see Elijah confronts Ahab. He's going to confront King Ahab in verses 17 through 19. Then we're going to see, for thirdly, uh, showdown part one. I call it showdown part one. And that's going to be the priest or the prophets of Baal who are going to try to win the contest, if you will. And that's going to be verses 20 through 29. And then we're going to have a mic drop moment with the prophet Elijah in showdown part two, defending and making known Yahweh to the people. And that'll be verses 30 through 40. And then lastly, we're going to see that the Lord is going to bring down the rain as he had promised Elijah in the beginning. And we're going to see that in verses 41 through 46. And if I were to put a tag on our text tonight, it would simply be this, the great showdown, the great showdown. So with that being said, I invite you to meet me in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 16 for the reading of the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Again, 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 16 together. Here's what it says. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. 
So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Then Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we will find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now, as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him and he recognized him. And and Obadiah fell to his face and said, is this you, Elijah, my master? He said to him, it is I. Go, say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. He said, meaning Obadiah, what sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said he is not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they could not find you. And now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. It will come about when I leave you that the spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. So when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to my master what I have, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water? And now you are saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. He will then kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah. A lot of stuff there. So quite a bit has passed, right? Quite a bit of time has passed since Elijah's encounter with the widow and the son. And the text tells us that there is now, it's now in the third year of the famine. We're in the third year of the famine in the land, which means that this is the last year. It's the last year of the famine. The reason why I say it's the last year is because we see in James chapter 5 that it actually gives us a duration of time in which the famine would last. So Really quickly, I just want to read into your hearing James chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. This is what, it, what, what James writes. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. So there's the time duration. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So there's our time duration there. And it's within this last year of the famine that the Lord that the word of the Lord, excuse me, comes to Elijah for his next steps. So the Lord gives Elijah a command. He tells him to go show himself to Ahab, and then he would send rain upon the earth. So in obedience to the word of the Lord, Elijah makes his way in that direction. Now, what becomes interesting to note, and we find it here in verse 2, is where the writer mentions that the famine was severe in Samaria. The famine was severe in Samaria. This statement becomes the writer's way to really lead us to the upcoming details of the narrative. Because indeed, this drought was severe. But most especially in the region of the land of Samaria more specifically. And the reason being is because Samaria was the headquarters of Israel's great apostasy and departure from the Mosaic law. So because of the extent of the drought's reach, it would force individuals to get creative to where they could find struggling sources of nutrition. So the scene is quickly now going to pivot to the introduction of our new character now on the scene, a man by the name of Obadiah. Now, we're told here that Obadiah was a servant of Ahab's household, 
But also the writer mentions that Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Very important to note there. In other words, Obadiah was in fact a follower of Yahweh. And this further expression in Obadiah's protection of the prophets lets us know that he was dedicated to doing the work and the will of the Lord. As a matter of fact, the text lets us know that he hid in, in the parentheses, if you'll notice in the text, you'll see that the scriptures tell us Obadiah is the guy that hid the hundred prophets in this cave and provided for them food and water while Jezebel was trying to ravishly uh, pursue them in order to kill them. And it's also worth mentioning just really quickly that this Obadiah is not the same Obadiah named after the Old Testament book. These are two different Obadiahs. So the writer continues by adding that this Obadiah, along with Ahab, was on a search. He's on a search for land and water to keep the horses alive. Again, resources are very scarce at this time. And because, again, the way of life during that day was very agrarian, it was very agriculturally driven, it required plentiful crops and water sources to sustain men and women, but also the cattle as well. And being that they're settling, they're setting out to look for um, patches of grass or patches of life, if you will, lets us know how severe, once again, this drought is. It gets so bad, friends, that someone figures it would be best to split up because they weren't conquering it together. Ahab said, listen, we, we, we're not cutting this out with just me and you huddling up together. We got to branch out and figure out where some good land is. And this is going to ultimately play out in a, in a that's God's sovereign plan regarding the splitting up. So as a result of that decision, what happens? Well, Obadiah, he comes across Elijah. <clears throat> he comes across Elijah and he falls immediately to his face in reverence to see, here's a prophet. Here's the biggest prophet of our day. And from that point, Elijah gives Obadiah very direct instructions. He says, go and tell your master, behold, Elijah's here. Behold, Elijah's here. To which Obadiah immediately responds, what sin have I committed that you're giving your servant into the hand of Ahab? Does that sound familiar really quickly? Remember last week? Uh, the widow had said a similar thing when circumstances arose for her. Her son dies and she says, what sin have I committed against the Lord? It, it, again, that, that play on that phrase comes back again. To paint a picture, friends, I, I want us to kind of see something here. Jezebel has searched throughout the entire land. And she's put out this edict and anybody who, who worships Yahweh or finds a prophet of Yahweh, they need to be killed. Jezebel wants nothing to do with Yahwehism. She wants nothing to do with the God of Israel. She wants it all destroyed. And if that wasn't good enough, verse 10 mentions that she goes to the surrounding nations and kingdoms and provides the edict of notice to swear. That if you know where he is, you're going to let us know so that we can find him and kill him. Now consider the deep conviction and necessity to eliminate truth from every public place and then for it to be replaced with lies concocted by governing leadership. This, this might sound a lot like what we're beginning to see more and more in our world in society today. You see, Jezebel becomes the very epitome of the causation of the collapse of nations by way of circumcising nations from their foundational truths. And if Jezebel didn't get things her way, well, you better believe she has the power of the pillow, which means she has the ear of the king. And with the ear of the king comes the power of his armory, and more. 
<laughs> so as Elijah tells Obadiah to go to King Ahab and to tell him that he is in the city, Obadiah is worried. And rightfully so. He's worried about his own life. So what does Obadiah do? He, he, he seems to be wavering a bit. He seems to be wavering a bit between wanting to obey this command that Elijah gives him, but also he's wanting to acquiesce to the corners of silence. Because I don't want to say it because if I say something, I'm going to get killed. And he doesn't want that to happen. Friends, it, it, it gets so bad that in verse 12, Obadiah says, if I tell the king you are here, what if the spirit of the Lord whisk you away? I have no account for what I've said, and therefore I'll die. So do you, I mean, do you feel the tension there in the text? It's comical, but yet there's tension within the conversation. And perhaps this is the tension that some may even find in and of themselves today. I mean, what do you do when you find yourself on the job and something is done that has Im that's improper or goes away in a negative context? What do you do when you've seen that? Do you just stay silent or do you speak up? If you see injustice on the job, do you just stay silent because you don't want to get dinged by the supervisor or the boss? Or do you step up and say, well, even if I lose my job, even if I lose this friendship, or even if I lose this opportunity, it's well with me because I did what was right. I stood up to my convictions, no matter what it cost. This is the crossroads, right? This is the crossroads where Obadiah fell. However, Obadiah takes Elijah at his word. He, he comes to his resolve and he's going to obey according to the word of the Lord. And he shares this report with King Ahab. And isn't that the definition really of what faith is, right? Not knowing what the next step looks like, but simply knowing that because God said it, I'll do it. That, that's, that's faith. Faith is the only vehicle by which God uses to demonstrate to men and women who he is. Well, Wesley, what do, you, what do, what do we see that in Scripture? Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us this. Check out the text with me. It says, and without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God, what? Must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Well, it's without fail that the Lord now is going to lead Elijah into the belly of the beast. King Ahab himself. Check out verses 17 through 19. It says this, <clears throat> And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you, is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel and Mount, at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal, and 400 prophet, prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. It's getting good. It's getting better and better here. So without fail, at the sight of Elijah, King Ahab moves to accuse Elijah of the drought. Do you, you see that? He accuses him of the drought. To which the, the, reading, the reader reading this account would say, well, ain't that the pot calling the kettle black here? How quick... Our sin blinds us to believe that we aren't the problem, but everybody else is. The reality was this drought was simply a physical demonstration of the king's spiritual condition, which now is reflected in the people as well. The king caused it because he broke the Mosaic law. Friends, sin doesn't just stay in one place right? No, if, if, if it can, it seeks to spread 
And it's going to spread quickly, especially when it is unchecked. And that is what has occurred. It began with Jeroboam, and now it has moved all the way to King Ahab. The true cause of this calamity was due to the king's compromises and restructuring of God's order and ways. Every king for both the north and the south are obligated and reminded about the conditions of the Mosaic law, about the Mosaic covenant. Yet, the further away they move from Solomon's rule and David's rule, the more we start seeing the departure from the ways of the Lord, (coughs) further and further away. And if you remember, this was the very warning, right? This is the very warning in which David's father And the Lord himself gave Solomon as a warning several times over. And this just goes to let us know that we as sheep need constant reminding. We need constant reminders to not go too far. I mean, think about it this way. Isn't that the purpose of a shepherd? To remind us to get back into order, get back into line. So in order to bring about a proper perspective for King Ahab to see and to understand this, he has to walk King Ahab down memory lane, if you will, to see where the departure actually first began. And isn't it amazing that the world even today sees Christianity more as opposition to truly loving people than they can? Issues that are rising now, oh, it's the Christian's fault. The Christian did this. And you're going to continue to see persecution of Christians arising all the more. You see, sin has a way of having people think that down is up and up is down. And in Elijah's case, truth in the midst of a delusional people must be greatly demonstrated. Elijah has to demonstrate this. And that's exactly what he's come to do with this showdown. He is about to show the power of God in this rebellious culture. And in a few short words, Elijah tells Ahab, I can show you who is both the creator of your calamity and who is the reliever of it. In my mind, I think about it's the, it's the mic drop moment where he says, let's do this. And he drops the mic. Check out with me verses 20 through 29. 1 Kings 18, verses 20 through 29. This is what it says. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, and put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other ox, and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, this is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves, and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a God. Either he is occupied or going aside or is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances. 
until the blood gushed out of them, out on them. When midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Well, the true challenge is, is happening. The showdown has begun between the God of Israel and this idol worship of Baal. And Ahab, he accepts Elijah's competition. He accepts the challenge and, and he even accepts the location in which he wants to do it. Uh, the location was a place called Mount Carmel, a very familiar place for Ahab and Baal prophets because it was considered the sacred, sacred dwelling place of Baal. For some, again, this is the difference between a home game advantage versus an opposing rival's home game. However, Elijah is not moved by location. He's not moved by where the match is going to take place because Elijah knows at the end of the day, who is God? Who is the true and living God? And at this point where all the people have assembled, Elijah draws near to them and with this powerful statement. He's almost like he's trying to give them a way out, if you will. He's like, we don't have to really do this. But if we do do this, you're going to see something. So if you want to go ahead and just check out, come to, the, come to the true side, right? Come to the real side. And he says this, how long will you hesitate between opinions? I, I, I love it. How long will you hesitate between opinions? That word hesitate in Hebrew is pasha, which means to limp or to waver. How long or in other words, how long will you all waver between the God of Israel and Baal? A choice, friends, has to be made as to whom you will serve. But you can't serve two masters. That's ultimately what Elijah is saying. And it's here that the people fell silent. They fell silent because they had no answer to give Elijah at this point, to give you lack of a better of better words, they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. We don't know what to do. And isn't that language a bit familiar in another previous Hebrew Bible book, uh, the book of Joshua? Remember in the days of, of, of Joshua, you might remember his words towards the latter end of his book, Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 15, he gives the people really this ultimatum as it relates to the Lord. I'm going to read verses 14 through 15 of Joshua chapter 24. Here's what the text says. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today. Here it is whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, the definitive statement, we will serve the Lord. So it's after Elijah's statement to choose that he lets them know that the odds of this competition are really stacked against them. And he mentions that he alone is left as the prophet of Yahweh. Now, again, that statement's a bit exaggerated because he's not the only prophet left, but as it relates to this demonstration, he's the only one standing before 450 odd illegitimate prophets. Okay. He then takes it a step further and has the opposing team's prophets choose the ox of their liking. You guys go ahead and choose first, right? You, you, you go first. Ideally, again, all the odds are in favor for King Ahab and Baal. They have prime location. They have all of their people. They have all of their stuff. And it's simply just Elijah himself with the Lord. And Elijah now is going to lay down the rules for the competition, He's going to lay down the rules of engagement for how it's going to work out. And he informs Baal's prophets and priests to prepare their oxen for sacrifice by cutting them up and laying them on the altar. But he gives this caveat. He says, but don't put any fire there. 
Set up your altar, get it ready, but no fire. And what becomes a bit comedic here is that not only was Baal considered a fertility god, but he was also the one who supposedly sent lightning from heaven, which could and would be able to cause fire. So again, let's just backtrack for a moment, right? Imagine within these past three years of drought and famine in the land, if Baal is this fertility God who is able to bring rain to water and bring about produce, but yet for three and a half years, it ain't been raining. Folks have been dying and suffering and your God is still silent. This is the point that the writer is making here. And so it leaves the question of tension on the opposing teams in hanging them in the balance as to this very question. Will they all answer this time? <laughs> Will he answer this time? So the writer continues. The competition begins and Baal's prophets are calling and pleading for Baal to consume the ox with fire from heaven. Friends, they call on Baal. Check this out. Morning, noon, even up to the evening point. They are screaming. They are yelling, they are pleading, yet no answer. It gets to the point that they become so desperate that they begin to cut themselves in an attempt to appease Baal to respond to their request, but yet to no avail, no response. Great silence. And you, you got to love the writer, right, in, in, in this narrative, especially the comedic gestures of Elijah. Because Elijah comes in and he's looking at all of this while they got, they're got they in their time slot to try to get this sacrifice to take place. And Elijah tells the prophets in, shoot, in, in, in few short words, hey guys, you might want to yell a little bit louder. He, he, he might not be able to hear you. You, 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 you might want to speak up a little bit louder. Maybe he's busy. You know what? Your God's probably too preoccupied right now. He then even digs a bit deeper. He says, you know what? He might not even be preoccupied, y'all. Y'all's God might be asleep. He says, they might be asleep. You might need to wake them up. And it's at the end of their time, right? They get to the end of their time. And within this duration, there was no response. No fire came down from heaven. No sacrifice consumed. 450 people. King Ahab, plus the additional uh, prophets and, and priests of the Asherah, they're all standing there, probably with their mouths dropped, a bit frustrated that the Lord, their God, hadn't shown up. Now, friends, what does that set the stage for? It sets the stage for Elijah to come back onto the scene and blow these boys out of the water. Clearly, this is the build-up anticipation that Elijah was looking for. Check out with me really quickly verses 30 through 40. This is what it says. Then the people said, then Elijah, excuse me, said to all the people, <clears throat> come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, meaning Israel, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. <clears throat> and he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. So now they're pouring water on it. And then he says, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And he did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel 
and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then, verse 38, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Here's verse 40. Then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. So the real demonstration is happening. Elijah calls for the people to come close as he's preparing the altar. And what becomes really significant here is that Elijah is rebuilding the very altar of Yahweh that the people had torn down. This had to be, right, as, as Elijah's preparing for his portion, had to be a sobering moment for these people to see. Probably a bit embarrassing if you were to think about it because Elijah is stacking up 12 stones. And perhaps as Elijah's stacking up these 12 stones, the people are remembering, right? They're remembering those moments in the book of Joshua when their forefathers and their, 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 their great-great-grandparents had stacked up these memorial stones. And here it is, Elijah is now stacking up 12 stones representing the tribes of Israel. And perhaps they're reminiscing as well on a once united Israel where the Lord had dwelled in the temple that was built by Solomon. I mean, this indeed was a moment that these folks would never forget. And Elijah proceeds to now prepare for his sacrifice, but now he does it with a twist, right? Here's that comical aspect of Elijah. He, he requests that there be a trench dug around the altar. And within those trenches, he's going to fill them to the brim along with the sacrifice itself being drenched with water. And he does this not once, not twice, but three times. He does this three times. After the point of preparation, the writer notes that it is time for the evening sacrifice. It simply means that it was about 3 o'clock p.m. when Elijah begins his portion of the challenge. And he steps forward and he begins not pleading, but praying. Do you see that? He begins not with pleading, but with praying. And he gives this prayer to the Lord. Notice Elijah's prayer is completely opposite of this pagan stuff. You see, where Baal's priests sought the attention of their God with loud voices and screams and cutting, Elijah is actually having an intelligible conversation with the Lord. Elijah's prayer is quite simple. He says, Lord, answer your servant so that this people will know that you are God and you and have turned their hearts back to you. What an amazing prayer. Immediately, friends, the text tells us that the fire of the Lord consumed everything on the altar and around the altar to the point that it looked like everything was licked clean, including the water. <laughs> including the water. As one could imagine, a sight like this would have left everyone speechless. And in this case, it moved the people to their faces and declaring aloud, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Friends, this was demonstration of repentance. Demonstration of the people repenting. You see, truth had to be made known to those who had been disillusioned by idol worship. Immediately, Elijah has every... But all prophets seized, brought down to the brook Kishon to be slaughtered. 
Now, some might ask, well, why did he do that? Like he, God just demonstrated his power. Why did he have to kill all those people? Well, friends, Elijah is going back to the word. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 12 through 15, it required it. Check out the text with me really quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 12 through 15. It says this. If you hear in one of your cities, which the Lord your God has given you to live in, anyone saying that some worthless men have gone out from among you and have seduced the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods whom you have not known, then you shall investigate and search out and inquire thoroughly. If it is true in the matter established that this abomination has been done among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, surely destroying it and all that is in it and its cattle with the edge of the sword. Well, this scene, again, it's after this scene of the promise that the Lord gives the now rain is beginning to brew in the background. Check out our last few verses, verses 41 through 46. This is what it says. Now Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go back seven times. It came about at the seventh time. I'd underline that in your text. It came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Here's verse 46. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. So as Elijah had predicted to Ahab, had prophesied to him that until he had given the word, there would be no rain in the land, right? We saw that in 17, actually a little bit earlier. And now here came the long anticipated words in which the king awaited for. Go get up and drink, for there is sound of the roar of heavy thunder. And without hesitation, what happens? King Ahab gets up. He goes to celebrate for this feast. He's getting ready to eat and drink because he's excited that rain is finally coming. <clears throat> and while Ahab is going to go and celebrate, Elijah proceeds back to the mountain, right? He's not going to go celebrate. He's going up to the mountain and he falls into a fetal position to do something to pray. Elijah is getting ready to pray for rain. Being friends that Elijah is in deep prayer, he sends his servant to go up and looks towards the Mediterranean Sea as to see if the rain is now beginning to come. And apparently Elijah has his servant go up to look to see if there's any sign of rain seven times Presume, presuming the servant did not see an indication of rain in those six times that he went up time and again. Now, what becomes a powerful point in this part of the narrative is Elijah's persistence in prayer. His persistence in prayer goes beyond words. Why? Because even when Elijah doesn't hear anything from his servant, he doesn't move in the position that he's in to seek a response from the Lord. He doesn't move. Elijah's prayers are not moved by his failures in seeing God not move yet. 
Rather, Elijah's prayers are all the more motivated because he's not going to move until he sees God move. Notice it's on that seven times that Elijah's servant says, I see something. He says, I see a small cloud, as small as a man's hand coming out of the sea, headed this way. It's at this site that Elijah immediately gets up and he attempts to send word to Ahab to hurry him to get the chariot and to get home quickly because this rain ain't going to be some small little tricklets, right? It's about to drench down like never before. And without fail, what happens? Clouds get darker, the winds begin to increase, and the rain commences. And the writer notes that the hand of the Lord at the end was on Elijah. That really concludes 18 here, but there's some things to see. What do we see the writer showing us in this narrative by the leading of the Spirit? I see three things. You may see more. First thing that I see is we see the sovereign hand of the Lord at work in his servant. The sovereign hand of the work the sovereign hand of the Lord, excuse me, at work in the servant. Secondly, we see the power of the Lord through prayer. (coughs) The power of the Lord through prayer. And thirdly, the power of the Lord over nature. Friends, all of this was accomplished during a time of great apostasy in Israel's history. And the Lord turned the hearts of the people back to himself by revealing to them and showing them that he is the creator God, that he is the all-powerful one. The Lord demonstrated that his power alone can sustain life. His power alone can replenish it and his power alone can deliver it. We saw in chapter 17 last week, that even amid the same famine that the Lord was able to sustain a widow, a prophet, and a son. And now the Lord is doing the same exact thing on a completely different level and has now been able to turn the hearts of men and women who were at one point disillusioned and now their eyes have been opened to the truth of God. The other thing, again, we saw was prayer. The persistence of prayer in the life of Elijah, that he did not give up because he didn't see the Lord move the first time he asked, do you see any rain? And if we were to be honest with ourselves, how many times do we relent in our prayer life because we don't see the Lord moving? I will be the first to raise my hand and say, there are days where when I don't see the Lord moving on prayer that I've prayed on for a period of time, that I get discouraged. But here we find that the scriptures are letting us know that despite what the circumstances may say, that you still are in divine connection with holy God. That as you continue to persist in your prayer life, even when you don't see things happening, know that God hears. Again, the last one, the power over nature. Friends, God is in control of all human affairs and natural interactions and affairs in this world. There's nothing that gets God. There's nothing that gets beside him or catches him by surprise. He is creator of all things. And when we hold that creator-creature distinction in order, that framework in order, what are we able to come to understand? That God is great, that God is good, and he's above all, and none can compare. As a matter of fact, if I were to put it in a small, pithy statement, I would say this, God alone is worthy to be worshipped, adored, and praised. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We thank you for your word, Lord, your word that brings truth, your word that is life, your word um, that brings um, so much clarity in a world, Father God, that brings so much confusion. I pray, Father, that you will help eyes be opened to know you, 
men that are blinded by truth and blinded by pride in their own ways, Father, I, I ask that you open up hearts. Lord, that you demonstrate to them in a mighty way through what, er, whatever circumstances you choose to do so, that you make it known to them, Father God, of what Christ has done over 2,000 years ago. Help us to see, help hearts to be mended, but most importantly, Father, may you be glorified in all that we do. And we'll be ever so careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory that you deserve. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.